before my sighting and not that I would have remembered it after, but it was just a fun, goofy, stupid song that, you know, what they would have called, they call a novelty number. Yeah. But I started going through um, basically a catalog of notes that I had taken years ago on more mainstream pop songs that deal with subject. And, um, you know, if you want, we can go through some of those lyrics and backstories as oh, far as what we do here today. Yeah, because I, I did write the book on music and, and UFOs after being inspired by Chris Bledsoe when he phoned me up and said, the message is in the music. And I said, well, you know, I'm not into music. And <laughs> then I found out that Neil, Neil Young had written this song after the Gold Rush. And Neil Young grew up where I, I live in a city that I make the joke, even people in Canada don't want to visit Winnipeg. And yet Neil Young grew up here. I would never have gotten into it if it had been Neil Young. He said, oh, Neil Young's involved. I said, Neil Young's involved? Are you kidding me? One of and, my all-time favorite performers and writers. My God. And, and then you mentioned in your interview, uh, uh, I went to look at, after the Gold Rush, if you look at the lyrics in there, that's this classic, the, the, the chosen ones are being taken off to another planet and the, we destroyed the planet and all this sort of stuff. And then I started looking at all the experiencers who had sung the song. And one is your friend, Patti Smith. She sang it. She changed the lyrics. We, uh, the um, Mother Nature on the Run in the 1970s, she changed it to Mother Nature on the Run in the 20th century. Nice. And, and that was the thing. She seems to be an experiencer too. Thought she was dropped on the planet and she's not from here and all that kind of stuff. And you see this bizarre sort of backstory to something that's going on here. Yeah, it's also an opportunity um, for songwriters. And I, I have to say, um, before my sister became a songwriter, she was a poet. And I was yet to become a writer. I was still very committed to my career in the visual arts. But I, once I started to write, and then at different points made parts of my living writing copy for the backs of VHS and then DVD things where you've got 150 words and you have got to sell the product, tell people why it's the most amazing DVD they've ever seen in their life, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> The challenge of reductivist writing and writing the lyric to a song, I'd much rather write a long chapter in a big book. <laughs> it's a lot less challenging. <laughs> That's so great. Well, with that, you guys, why don't I just do a short introduction and then we'll dive on into all of this creativity and okay. ecology talk. But I'm Nicole Sackage, and I'm here with Grant Cameron and our new friend, Chase Williams, and we're here today to talk about artists and ufology, and we're leading up to a panel discussion on this, and of course, uh, we want to do some long-style interviews before we bring on a panel for discussion, and our first guest is the wonderful Peter Robbins. And Peter, you've been involved in ufology for multiple decades, and we'd be silly not to include you in on this. Um, your own history with art, your relationship with Bud Hopkins, some of the lectures you've given recently, which we were just talking about, your two-part series on artists and aliens, a brilliant podcast that we're all giving ourselves a crash course on. And I even came across a lecture you gave on advertising and that kind of art which is I collect some advertising from over the years so that kind of piqued my interest but I think we're just going to let you uh introduce yourself a little bit and we'll let Grant and Chase dive in with some questions and I'll have some questions along the way as well so welcome Peter well, welcome I, Chase I, thank you <laughs> welcome Grant thank you and greetings from just outside of Ithaca New York uh, on a fairly temperate day, the upside of global warming. Uh, should have snow on the ground about now, but we don't. Um, I began my professional life uh, very convinced that what I wanted to do was be a painter uh, or some kind of visual artist. And I was lucky enough to be uh, encouraged in that as a, a somewhat gifted kid in the visual arts. And by the time I was in my 20s, I was living, eating, and breathing the New York art world. Um, when I was in my late 20s, <clears throat> a memory uh, from childhood that I had repressed returned and returned with a vengeance. It was um, of a childhood UFO sighting my sister Helen and I had had. And I um, 
I was not able to deal with it at the time. It, it challenged everything that I thought I knew. And as people can sometimes do, we find ways to put a lid on it and completely forget it. Uh, sadly, it happens a lot more uh, commonly in the conventional world of, you know, sexual abuse or whatever kind of trauma. Um, and if it does come up, it's usually when the mind is ready to deal with it. And in my case, more than 14 years passed mm -hmm. before that time. And when it did, um, it came on with a vengeance. And I was very shaken. It came up in the course of 15 or 20 minutes of going through a stack of drawings I had done many years before. I could go on as to why I thought it happened then. I think the most important reason was because I was ready to deal with it. Um, I knew I could confirm it by speaking to my sister who um, lived uh, a mile or so north of me, she in the East Village in Manhattan, me down in East Chinatown. And I at least had the forethought to think it out before I called her. And what had occurred to me was that I did not want to just get her on the phone and blurt out this memory and then find out if she remembered the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes or no wasn't going to do it. So um, I basically set it up for her uh, about how old we were, the time of day, where we were standing in the village that we came of age in. And at one point she cut me off fairly early mid-sentence and said, stop, I know what you're talking about. Told me what I remembered. The variation was she wasn't sure whether it was five or six disc-shaped objects. I remembered uh, five in a very precise V military kind of formation. And um, we worked that out very quickly the next day because after we got off the phone, I did my very first UFO artwork, uh, a painting of six. So that when I showed it to her, I could show it to her covering the one in the lower right and then take my hand away. And she agreed that it was five. And I remember feeling a, a moment of kind of split elation and anxiety of, oh my God, it's real. And oh my God, it's real. Mm -hmm. And then she said something to me that changed my life forever, which was, but there's more. And then went on to describe archetypical um, clear memories that she had never forgotten. For her, this always remained conscious, but it was nothing she ever felt compelled to talk about, of being taken literally off the ground um, and being taken into one of these craft. This was the mid seventies. Um, I had never paid attention to the subject. The term gray, and these were decidedly grays, was still some years from existing. And she described them to me in a more childlike way, ended up doing drawings of them. And my first thought upon hearing her was my sister's gone crazy and then caught myself and said to myself, ah, but it was okay eight seconds ago that there were five silvery white flying saucers over the neighbor's house, close enough to see windows, listen to what your sister's saying. Mm -hmm. um, my sister who passed in 2000 and I were very close siblings, shared a lot of stuff um, as artists, as friends, as roommates over the years. And I just became obsessed with the subject. So that's my basic background um, in how I became involved. And um, any and all questions, welcome. Um, I just have a quick comment, I guess. I, in another interview that I was watching over the last couple of days, you mentioned these jumps in like 14 years and then you had a memory of it or you could recall it. And I believe there was another instance some years later where your grandmother gave you some of your art from your younger years and then you also came across your early portfolio and kind of this ufology related artwork you destroyed it yes yeah. um i'm old enough that um i, I really came of age um, at the halcyon height of the 60s mm -hmm. and was a full-scale member of the counterculture. Um, my first LSD trip was still when the drug was still, before it was made illegal. And that was many years ago. Um, it was 
a dose, Sandoz Pharmaceutical manufactured in Switzerland. And um, during that first acid trip, the memory returned in a not surprisingly distorted manner. Mm -hmm. And I got so caught up in it and in preparing for this experience. Um, and it was, I guess, as good a first experience with psychedelics as anyone could have had. Uh, a core number of friends were together. Several who had done it were there just to watch over us and, uh, you know, stay straight. And several of us were doing it. But m part of my preparation, besides my friends completely cleaning my apartment and stocking it with nice, you know, healthy foods and all that, was to have all of my art supplies out, knowing I might well use them. And I ended up doing a series of watercolors, again, very distorted, but dealing with the subject. And then in the same day, bound them up in a book, which I thought was very clever of me and put it away in an old portfolio that did become old. And as you noted, came upon it years later and was so shocked I think it was that momentary, oh my God, if this happened, I can't deal with it still. And I destroyed it. I mean, I destroyed it and then forgot about it again. How we do these things, I don't know, but I did it. The point you make, um, which was certainly one of the factors, I, I think a key factor in bringing this memory out again was um, my father's mother, um, uh, she and my grandfather were lifelong New York City residents. And uh, my grandfather passed when I was fairly young. Graham lived on her own until she was almost 100, quite a gal. And at least once a month, I'd go over to her apartment to have dinner. She lived fairly close to where I went to art school as well and taught. And after dinner one day, she said, I have something for you, dear, and disappeared into her closet, came out, with this little cardboard handmade portfolio, I'm guessing that my grandfather made for childhood drawings and gave it to me. And in it were several dozen drawings that I had done from about the age of 14 or so back to maybe six years old. And this was not a time when parents routinely saved their little geniuses drawings and put them up on the refrigerator. My theory on that, it's because it was before refrigerator magnets were invented. That's not a scientific <laughs> theory, but. And um, I had uh, an ex-girlfriend at the time, a dear friend, and um, she worked in advertising. And uh, a lot of, I mean, everything was analog then. And drawings and renderings were often done on acetate. So you could do overlays. And she had done a job, had a big roll of acetate left and said, give me the drawings. I will put them all in acetate, ring it with electrical tape, because a lot of them are really fragile, manila paper and all, which was a wonderful gift to me. And I put them in a separate portfolio. But that afternoon, I was going through them, Nicole, mm -hmm. and none of them dealt with the subject at hand, but several of them were done right at about that period of time. And I was sitting on the floor of my loft in Chinatown going through them. And it was a trigger. And that memory returned. And within a matter of two minutes or so, it was like a tape loop going through my mind that I couldn't stop. And the associated feeling was I must be having some kind of mental issue here. Because if what I'm thinking and feeling is true, I forgot about the most amazing thing that ever happened to me in my life. How could that happen? I must be crazy. Got very upset, calmed down, centered myself, had a cup of tea, and that's when I called my sister. Wow. I loved that part of your story, Peter. And I don't know, there we, you and I have some synchronicities across telling our, or sharing our stories with each other, but my grandmother too, you know, did kind of the same move with me. You know, she had saved all these things from everything, you know, newspaper clippings, all of it. She even saved our old, uh, we used to play rummy and she would keep tallies of who won and who lost. And she, of course, That's called great. herself the ultimate winner <laughs> when she gave me this box of memories. And yeah, my, to sum up my story, when she gave me mine, I was in my early 20s. 
And it made me go back to like a keepsake box I had full of my old journals and diaries because I was going to add it to that. And that's when I first came across my journal entries from my first sighting experience and some other journal entries. I was boy crazy when I was 14, 15. And it's like, oh, and no, I actually took a portion of mine and destroyed it. I was like, this is so silly. I can't believe I ever wrote it or pondered this. But yeah, I just thought when my future, whoever family reads this, they're not reading this part. That's <laughs> what I and it's gone so right there with you <laughs> it does happen i experiencers <laughs> i think revisit this and get embarrassed but ooh, the same I, way think, I was so excited for you to say and i still have them <laughs> and oh what a memory that would be but grant or chase did you want to jump in here real quick before we let peter move on you guys are both on mute I don't, I don't have anything pressing at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to keep listening to what Peter has to say. I've got some ideas, but I'll jump in a bit later. All right. Hey, I'd like to hear, well, he's, he's already going through it, but the, the, um, the, the whole idea, uh, the question I had was you're, you're, you work with Bud Hopkins and the idea has always come up that um, the beings have a, method to who they take and so my question to you in in as you tell your story is to look at was it random what happened to you because you were not involved in the experience that your sister had being taken aboard correct uh but the question to me is is it is is your experience my experience as a researcher a random thing or did they trigger you and and i think you'll eventually tell the story when you go to rendlesham forest yeah. And you have this bizarre, almost like they're waiting for you and saying, okay, here he comes, turn the lights on. And I, <laughs> that's part of the story I didn't know. And that goes back to the Bud thing with Bud Hopkins. When And you can maybe tell the story because I'd like to hear it from you. Because yeah. I actually looked for Bud's uh, report from 1975. I couldn't find it. That it got could. him going. That was the year I had my experience. That's maybe the year you had your experience. And Bud had his experience. And we were all triggered at that time. And so I remember back when Bud was telling the story of his sighting in the 1960s. And I remember when 60s. he was telling it, I, he was telling it like an experiencer, how, you know, he went, re -re he, he took the road again, how long did it take, where it was, uh, you know, how, how far had he had this experience taken place. And then the thing with the, with the, the beings with the holes in 1975, where he goes and checks us out. And it seemed like very strange, like the aliens are like digging holes. I mean, it's almost like he was dragged into it. You were dragged into it. I know I was when I look back that I was dragged into this. So I, if you can tell your story in those yeah. um, aspects of, of um, maybe, or even the thing where they sabotage your career, it's sort of like, you know, well, you're, you're, you're ready to do art and they say, no, no, you're not doing art. You're going to do UFOs. And they make you draw these stupid circles that, that end your, <laughs> your art career. So uh, those are the kind of things I'd like to hear when you tell yeah. your story, because you've got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Yeah. I, um, I was fortunate to meet Bud very early on. And um, I know somewhere in the MUFON publications, I'm sure that case, the so-called George Obarsky case, that was the witness in question, exists. I'm pleased to say that I do have um, a digitized copy of Bud's write-up of that case as it appeared um, in his very first piece of UFO writing, which he sold to um, a New York Weekly uh, called The Village Voice. Doesn't exist anymore, but it's the last place one would imagine as a New Yorker finding a UFO case. Um, it was more an old progressive publication dealing with local and national politics. And first, um, so much of the work that we do, of the research that we do is based on accounts. And we make our judgments based on the credibility and the character of the witness. If we get to meet them and spend time, is this person somebody who I should believe? There's nothing but their word to put forward. And then that that thing exists in all of us that is the text of the iconic 
uh, X-Files poster, I want to believe. I want to believe this. I want to believe that. I don't want to believe this. I don't want to be that. believe that. A lot of this, I, function, I think, functions on a, um, a subconscious level. And we think we're being objective, but we do have deeply entrenched attitudes, beliefs, things that threaten the set order of our lives, even if we are so open-minded that our brains sometimes feel like they're going to fall out. Um, and I don't, I've never thought or never felt that they, and I've always felt uncomfortable using the word alien. Um, it's just my own personal quirkiness. I, I usually find myself referring to them um, as other intelligences. Plus, it was some years into my coming of age in this work that I started to really think out that the ones that I was fixated on, the ones whose craft, for lack of a better term, my sister and I saw, the ones who took my sister, were one group, one race, one subdivision, and that we might well be dealing with so many myriads of other intelligences uh, from out there, from another dimension, from inside the earth, who knows, it's a moot point. Um, and so much of it is speculative. And I always find myself backing away from people who speak in absolutes. It's one thing to say, there are 56 alien races visiting the planet Earth. It's another thing to say, I believe there are, I think there are, my attitude is, my research suggests, and when you cross that line, you have a problem with me. It's the same thing as saying all aliens are good or all aliens are bad. It's, I, I don't think in those terms. And I think we, we take ourselves off on a tangent that is in no way helpful or objective when we get that in our head. When the, uh, the president decided to create our space force, I thought, hmm, that's probably not going to be something geared to go out into the cosmos and greet with flowers our, our neighbors. They're getting ready to kill each other. And that whole macho mindset of men in power um, for me governs that decision. To backtrack, um, 1975, this happens to me. And I'm in a world where I don't know that there's something called ufology. I don't know that there are people out there doing work around this. Um, a vague awareness that there are books on the subject, magazines on the subject. I didn't know anybody in my life who was ever interested in it as a kid or as an adult. I take that back. I had a girlfriend uh, in university quite a bit older than me. I fell in love with her because she was um, a figure model for drawing class that I was in. And we were introduced with her getting up on the drawing stand and taking her clothes off. I was 20 years old and somewhat impressionable. One thing led to another fairly quickly, it was the 60s. But when we did start to get close, she told me that she had been taken in a UFO, et cetera. And I guess I had a look in my eyes and she burst into tears and she said, you don't believe me either. And all I could think was, I don't wanna mess around with this great thing I have here with this beautiful older woman and I have a sex life now. Um, and I really don't wanna lose that. And I apologized and told her, no, I did take her seriously and I didn't. Um, 1975 comes along, this happens to me and I start buying books. Um, I find out that there are some organizations. I start writing letters, everything analog. In fact, behind me, you can see just over this shoulder, notebooks. Some of them go back to the 70s. They're one notebook after another, after another that I start to keep, often Xeroxing articles, cutting and pasting, gluing things down. That was my original database. And you know now it's kind of charming and ancient, but I think in future it will be a value to people interested in the subject to see how some of us got involved and got deeper into the subject. So I'm now almost a year into the work, so I know everything. Um, and my attitude is power to the people, the government's lying, cover it up. 
covering it up. Um, let it all out now. And um, what are you hiding this for? And not even thinking that there were more than one group of them. And I go by a newsstand and there's that copy of the Village Voice with this article by a man named Bud Hopkins. Up until then, my major source of uh, periodical information was the National Enquirer. Uh, at the time, you know, now it seems so tame, but at the time, you know, quite shocking at times and making claims that were actually not true. Um, we now know with some irony that one of the things that they got right more often than not was their legitimate UFO coverage. It just fit into the madness of the silliness of the, of the publication, but they did do their homework. And a lot of the cases that they covered were actually authentic and fairly well documented. I had never picked up a publication that had nothing to do with the subject with an article about the subject in it. And I went home and I read it. And for the life of me, I thought this is the best single case I have ever read in part because it's really well researched and it's really well written. I've got to meet this guy. Now, the New York art world, um, you know, at the time, certainly, and still uh, involves a number of people who are world famous, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of artists working in New York City at any given time following their dreams. And I knew there was a late pe period abstract expressionist named Bud Hopkins. Bud spelled his first name with two Ds. And the person that wrote the article, I thought, could it be the same person? I had seen some of his work in a group show some years before. Again, it was the old days. I went to the New York City phone book, which was about that thick, found the only Bud Hopkins in the book and cold called him and introduced myself. I thought I better, you know, I've only got one shot at this. <laughs> As um, a fellow artist teaching at the School of Visual Arts, I thought that would impress him. And that um, I had read his article, really uh, found it very valuable. And I was calling him because my sister and I had had a sighting when we were kids. She had an experience. And um, I wonder if we could talk sometime. First question out of his mouth was, tell me about your art. Now, this can be the most polarizing moment in the beginning of a friendship or a lack of friendship <laughs> between two artists. I came of age in the, um, the time of minimal art, conceptual art, um, art as process, performance art. Bud was old school. I told him some things about the work that I was doing. He was not impressed. <laughs> but he was fascinated by my sister's experience and invited me over for coffee. And, you know, you guys all know, there are times in our lives we don't realize they're happening, but we look back on them and realize that was a turning point, absolutely life-defining turning point. He lived in a very nondescript building, a four-story building on, on West 16th Street that no longer exists. It's gone now and a, a little modern apartment is there his building dated from the 1870s. And um, I rang the doorbell, opened the door, great face. I used to joke with him that I remembered him when he had dark brown hair, uh, Dave Jacobs too. And um, he invited me in and we went up to the second floor, which was his residence. Um, his studio was wonderful. It was actually two studios on the lower floor. And we sat at the table and we had a cup of coffee and we talked about art and life and UFOs which many years later was the title of his last book, Art, Life, and UFOs, which is one of the great American memoirs I've ever read. Um, it's just a terrific book for anybody, I think, that's interested in an interesting life lived in the 20th century primarily, and certainly for anybody in the field. Of course, while we're sitting there, you know, talking and drinking coffee, I have no idea that this is the first of about 10,000 cups of coffee I'm gonna have at that table over the next 35 years. And more than quite a few shots of scotch, uh, especially as we became closer. Um, again, this was 1976. So he was five years away from publishing his first book. And like me, his interest in the subject had been triggered rather dramatically. Although as you note, um, uh, Grant, 
he had had a sighting earlier. Bud had a home on Cape Cod where he summered basically every summer for the last 50 years of his life until he got really ill. And I think about 1965, he was walking on the beach on a cloudy afternoon and observed a, all by himself, a disc shaped thing over the water, just nice as you please, going at a fairly nondescript pace, not very fast. He did several drawings of it. One I still have a copy of, um, noting direction, shape, you know, a couple of notations on it. But as he told me, um, it wasn't the make it or break it. He had heard about UFOs and flying saucers, but at the same time, um, it was interesting, but he filed it. In 1975, um, he was um, on his block um, where there was a local liquor store. Bud was a scotch drinker, not some fancy brand. He was a Cuddy Sark man. And um, he was going out to get a bottle of scotch. And this was when this part of New York was still a real old fashioned neighborhood. Uh, gentrification cuts both ways. And uh, George Obarski was the name of the guy who owned the liquor store. And they had, you know, a affable, um, I wouldn't call it a friendship, but certainly a, a nice acquaintanceship, and, you know, exchange the time of day, not too deep. George, who I met sometime after that, was a real American archetype, World War II veteran, barrel chested, crew cut, um, Catholic widower, and he was always, you know, glad enough to see Bud and chat a bit, but George was very withdrawn that day, and Bud, who was nothing if not a humanist, um, he cared about people very much and loved being a New Yorker. He grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia. He pushed George a bit, and, you know, this, obviously there's something wrong. When you wouldn't believe me if I told you. He said, well, you know, try me. Nobody else come in and out of the store quiet afternoon. And George tells him the story that sometime before, I forget how far before offhand, um, he was staying late to do an inventory. Um, the neighborhood joke about George was that he owned a liquor store, but he didn't drink. Ha ha. Um, and he closed up about two in the morning and was driving home. Um, probably took the Lincoln Tunnel, I'm guessing, or the Holland Tunnel. And there, if you know the greater New York area, there's a road on the Jersey Shore right along the East River paralleling Manhattan Island. And um, he's heading up. He's at about the 86th Street cross point. And his radio starts to fritz out. And as we all, if you're old enough to remember in the pre-digital days, the way you deal with the radio that's not coming in right, is technically um, the remedy was often pound on the dashboard several times and maybe something <laughs> will fall back into place. Well, he did it, didn't help. The road was empty except for a car coming up behind him. And I'll parenthetically insert here that this episode is something that became part of uh, UFO uh, documented lore and that Steve Spielberg's writers in putting together Close Encounters drew on it um, for a wonderful scene early on in Close Encounters where he sees this car coming up behind him, realizes the lighting is a little funny, it's a little higher than it should be. The closer it gets, the higher the static gets on the radio. And as it comes up behind him, it goes right over the roof and continues up the road in front of him makes a decided left turn and heads out into an empty field. I don't know if the field is still empty, but the nearest apartment house, which was a brand new one, was around apartment complex, much like the famous Capitol Records building in Los Angeles. It's called the Stonehenge Apartments. You can't make this stuff up. And he slowed down to like zero miles an hour and watched as it came down, all without a sound, gears landing, um, a three-point landing system came down, it settled down. He watched as an exit way came down, 
and observed a number of diminutive beings coming down and was still close enough that he could observe. Um, lighting obviously was good enough. Them seeming to be digging or messing around with the soil. And in a matter of, you know, a very brief period of time, they were back up, the apparatus retracted, it rose, the gears went back into the ship, it tipped slightly. And he said at this point he could hear something like a refrigerator style hum. And then it was as big as a star. Well, that changed Bud Hopkins, the painter's life. Thank God he never stopped painting and he was a wonderful artist. Although his imagery never involved flying saucers or UFOs, he was an abstract artist. Uh, I did joke with him occasionally that discs and circles and half circles would come up in his work, but you know, that's not the most amazing coincidence in the world. <laughs> and we used to have fun with that. Um, but he then set about to determine for himself, incredible, wonderful curiosity about so many things, what the story was and um, started on his path of being as fine a self-trained investigator as I have ever met in my entire life. I joked with him sometimes that had he gone into law enforcement as opposed to the arts, God help the criminal element in New York City. He started by going back to the complex, interviewing the doorman, finding out who the night doorman was, interviewing him, learning that there was a police detective who lived in the building, who had apparently come in, who the doorman knew was there. The doorman is watching this thing out in the field, didn't see it land, but looked out to see lights. Didn't give it too much of a thought because it was a place where, you know, teenagers and the like would go parking and making out. Um, but he did pay, take notice when it took off. And he went to ring the cop, the, the police detective in the building. And as he lifted the receiver, the entire plate glass window in front of him shattered. A forensic investigation was conducted by the local, um, I don't know whether it's Fort Lee, I forget what town it was in Jersey, but they could not find a, um, a contact point, a penetration point where a projectile might have hit it. It just broke. Um, he then uh, interviewed a young couple um, with a baby in the apartment at the time who were up because the baby was up and they saw the thing go by their window and so on. And then he wrote it all up. Well, we stayed in regular contact after that. I would say it was still a friendly acquaintanceship, but we'd get together a couple of times a year and you know do what we did, uh, hang out, have a drink, um, go out for a meal, uh, talk about UFOs, talk about the art world, uh, the museum shows. He also loved theater um, and so did I. When I worked in New York off-Broadway theater, he came to see every show that I house managed, which was great fun. Once he brought Roger Lear, which was even more fun. Um, but in 81, his life changed definitively again. He published his first book, Missing Time, which not only gave the world of UFO literature one of its most important seminal works on the abduction phenomenon, it was very well researched and documented. If I remember correctly, it involved like seven cases of individuals. I'm still in close contact and friends with two of the people whose cases were in that book. And all of a sudden he became Bud Hopkins, the ufologist. The New York art world did not in so many words without, well, without saying anything, did not think this was a boon to his art portfolio. Uh, the ridicule factor, which only in the last few years, as we know, has begun to dissipate and dissipate seriously. Um, it ran things from 1947, let's say, until 19, 2017. And the fact that Bud Hopkins, the late period abstract expressionist, moving more into a modernist realm, um, was enamored by the subject we all knew is silly. It did not help his career. And I, I think it probably undercut the value of his work, uh, the shows that he was getting into, et cetera. But like me, he was committed. And about that time, he started getting mail. 
and at a certain point, a lot of mail and asked me if I had any time to help out with the mail. Of course I did, and I was fascinated by it. So I started to come by a couple of times a month and answer letters and things. Uh, our friendship deepened. And in 87, once again, his life changed very dramatically in that he published his um, best-selling book of all times, Intruders, uh, The Visitation at Copley Woods, involving um, a woman who at the time went by a, a pseudonym, uh, Debbie, who's still one of my dearest friends, um, in Kokomo, Indiana. Um, that totally put him on the map internationally for anybody that hadn't heard of him, um, secured his international reputation, and all of a sudden he was inundated. Um, he was already a major player on the conference circuit and on television on the subject. We did, uh, the first show I appeared with him on, which I always be very proud of, was the original um, Unsolved Mysteries, a 1988 episode about abductions. And um, I was totally thrilled because it was, you know, the narrator was um, Robert Stack, Elliot Ness of The Untouchables. It doesn't get any better. Uh, we went on to do the Geraldo show together with my sister and several other people and so on. But for me, most of um, my focus was I'm, I'm in an amazing position here. Um, I'm a bug on the wall of one of the most important researchers on one of the most important subjects in the history of humanity. And the fact that I don't get paid for it um, and that a lot of people think it's silly doesn't matter. I know history will see this differently. And in- And that your, your, your art career was over at that point. Well, yes and no. Um, what happened was because you have to understand um, most Folks, I'm, I am an elitist. I am a snob. I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a wise guy, Jewish intellectual. I'm very well read. I have a BFA, um, unlike most people whose degrees took them four years. Mine took me 15 years, but I got it. <laughs> and the art for me was not about painting on a Sunday and you know, showing it at a crafts fair. It was aiming to have my work in major museums around the world. It was to be represented by the best art dealers in New York City. Um, I was working hard to make it happen. Uh, I had already met um, uh, Andy Warhol. He, I knew him well enough that he knew my name. I spent time in his studio, Roy Lichtenstein, I was studio assistant to Adolf Gottlieb, one of the last of the great abstract expressionists right up there with um, Jackson Pollock or uh, de Kooning or Franz Klein. Um, this was no joke for me. And I had my career set. I knew what I was going to do. And the fact that it was not important to anybody's survival, that it was an elitist kind of behavior, I could care less. I was earning a lot of my living um, during the um, kind of the renaissance in that old warehouse district down in lower Manhattan called Soho, which when I was growing up didn't have a cute acronym. It was just 10 square blocks of abandoned warehouses and factories, mostly in a place you wouldn't want to be caught at night. But I was working as a construction worker on building after building there. Uh, my specialty was framing carpentry and demolition. And one night a week, I teach at visual arts. Um, after a while, I got a teaching gig at a private school in Brooklyn Heights and worked there with kids. Um, but all of a sudden there was this new thing in my life. And I, I'll say it right here. I really hated it um, to a degree. I, I was resentful that something had um, placed itself in my path that I knew was more important that I knew was more significant, that I knew deserved the world's attention. And I felt a bit like somebody was dragging me kicking and screaming from one room to another. I don't feel in any way, shape or form that they determined this. Um, I think that's romanticizing 
my obsession. Um, it happened to me and I couldn't stop doing it. At the same time, I had invested so much time from childhood on in this dream that I had no idea what else I could or should do. So I continued at it, but the heart had gone out of it to a degree. I worked in galleries at one point. I contracted to be working in six of the biggest galleries in lower Manhattan. I was the guy who came in once a month, took the paintings off the wall from the previous show, brought them back into the office, pulled the nails, puttied the hole, painted it white, drove the new nails, hung the new show, and these gigs paid my bills. Not that they were very major. You could live in New York City on a modest amount of money back then, but I was living my dream. And what happened immediately was I just started to paint and draw depictions of UFOs, some of them fairly serious and studied, some of them more cartoon-like. And they started to estrange my friends in the art world who you know, thought I had as good a shot as being a player as anybody. One of my friends from art school got what was happening to me. Uh, my friend Saul Ostra, who went on to become a very distinguished art historian. And he encouraged me to do it, but to do it in a way that had some intellectual allegory to it, um, that the UFOs could represent fear of the unknown um, and that I could play it against another image. And what could that image be? And after thinking about it long and hard, I decided on a tank, this clunky, deadly military vehicle that in one sense um, was horrifying, in another sense was incredibly um, ungainly and cartoon-like. And I started to, for all the UFOs I made, I started to make tanks. I made them out of cardboard. I um, had access to a kiln and glazes and I made lots of tanks and interposed them with UFOs. So uh, there was an interplay there that I could get, get away with and not look like I had just become an outsider and was, you know, this mumbling goofball. Uh, when Close Encounters came out and that incredibly poignant scene at the dinner table came up later in the film of Richard Dreyfuss's character building the Devil's Tower out of mashed potatoes and the kids and the wife on the edge of tears and running out of the room. That was me at a certain point. And I should say also, because it wasn't like it was now, it is such a part of popular culture. And if all of a sudden something like happened to me, happened to somebody else today, all they'd have to do is push a button on their computer and see there's a zillion UFO related things and organizations and personalities and books and you're immediately part of a community. I felt more and more isolated and so much so that within months, I realized um, this was having a really negative at, um, impact on my day-to-day -day life. I'd be walking down East 23rd Street late afternoon, early evening to go teach my painting class on Monday nights and being um, very filmatic. Um, if I had not gone into the visual arts, I probably would have gone into filmmaking it was my minor in my, my degree, um, film history. My mind did something it sometimes does, which is just split into two screens. And in one screen, I'm me doing what I'm doing. In another one, I'm someplace else. And in this case, it was at the very end of the original, don't even bother with the follow-up as far as I'm concerned, being a film snob, uh, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 1956, starring the great B actor, Kevin McCarthy. Um, oh, you can't see it here, but there's a nice picture of him over there that he signed for me. We talked about his experience of working on the film. Very cool. Um, he's standing in the middle of a highway and he's screaming at people cars going by, you know, they're here, they're here, you're next, you're next. It's actually one of the most compelling scenes in any B science fiction movie. And then it dissolves to him in the police office because it's all a flashback. You don't believe me either. And then we come to the finale, which I won't say for anybody that's seen the film, but I felt very close to running into the road to do this. That's not healthy. That's not good. And I thought I need help. 
And um, I had been reading the work of Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who for me is one of the millennial geniuses of all time, whose um, you say his name and most people, if an eyebrow doesn't go up, they already have an opinion about him based on something they've read or heard about him. Very few of them have ever read anything that he ever wrote. But by this time, I started reading him when I was a teenager. I had been reading him for 10 years. And I remember sort of a footnote that interests me not at all. He got very interested in UFOs the last few years of his life. And he had a first assistant who was his first assistant for the last 11 years of his life, who on kind of a whim, I decided to find out if he was still alive because I thought I needed a therapist for the first time in my life. And Dr. Baker would be ideal, but he'd be real old. And who knows if he was still practicing. Well, not only was he alive and well, he was practicing in his uh, home area in Red Bank, New Jersey, and in the same office that he had been practicing for many years on the Upper East Side. And after uh, a number of phone calls, brief ones, um, I entered into therapy with him. Baker had had um, a UFO sighting with Reich doing cloud busting work in Maine. And then another one, um, three UFOs behind a cloud, orange circular disc shaped ones over his own house. I knew number one is a distinguished psychiatrist that he'd never laugh at me or look at me funny. And he helped me normalize it and just adjust to it and that things like this happen and that my sister and I were not crazy. We did live in a crazy world and that there was probably a need for people to take this seriously and do this kind of work. I digress, but I think you understand why. So again, tailing off on the very long answer to your very short question, um, I continued to paint and draw. I continued to teach painting and drawing. And it was quite a number of years before writing fully filled in. Thankfully, I never really put down my camera. I've considered myself an avid, occasionally professional photographer since I was in my 20s. And that was kind of my creative outlet, along with writing. You know, um, it can possess you as much as any other kind of art form. And indeed, even if you write nonfiction, arguably, it is an art form as well. Um, can, can you, uh, just one last question, and then you can sort of um, go on. Did Bud ever tell you the story about being involved with War of the Worlds as a young child? With who? The War of the Worlds as a young child? Yes. And in fact, he writes about it eloquently in his memoir. But at the time when he told me, 30 years earlier, it was strictly between us because Phil Class already had targeted Bud as somebody that he was going to make a major point of attacking. For any of your audience that is not aware, Phil Class was um, uh, kind of debunker in chief. And, and there's a big difference between being a skeptic, which we should all be, and maintain our skepticism sharply. <laughs> the better known <laughs> and the more experienced we are because we know, you know, at a certain point in our work, we know this is real. But, you know, uh, as I would say, have said, we no longer have the luxury of disbelief. And that can open up a potential problem if you get a case or a situation that, you know, meets all the basic entering hallmarks and you just accept it as such. I learned that the hard way. Um, you still need to go back to the baseline and follow all your protocols as carefully as you can to do your work properly and arrive at the conclusions in a reasoned, scientific, deliberate way. Um, yes, the story was very simple. Um, Bud was born, as I recall, 1931. So that would have meant that um, in 38, October 30th, the night before Halloween, uh, Orson Welles and his marvelous Mercury Players, Theater of the Air, uh, many of which whom he took to Hollywood with him, who appear in Citizen Kane and the Magnificent Ambersons and other films that he did over the years. Um, they did a radio play based on H.G. Wells' famous War of the Worlds. Now, War of the Worlds is set in London, in England, um, 
in 1899, 1900 or so. A marvelous um, uh, radio um, scriptwriter, Howard Fass, um, was assigned the job of updating it and making it Americanizing the story and collapsing weeks into what was it, a half an hour show or something, not much longer. And it was so brilliantly written and so wonderfully informed by sound effects and cutaways that we have to remember this was a much more innocent time. And this is against the backdrop that Europe had gone to war the month before. So America, Americans who were mostly isolationists at the time were, were fairly anxious about it. And in Bud's family, his dad was a perfect example of a certain kind of American. Um, Bud's dad was a very macho guy. He had been an officer, an army officer in World War I, and he was an army officer in World War II. And um, Bud's bedroom wall was adjacent to his parents' bedroom wall. And his mom, who was overly concerned about Bud because he had polio as a boy, a very young boy, and it left one leg about probably less than half an inch shorter than another. And unless you knew him really well, you wouldn't pick up on it at first, but he walked with a bit of a gait. And he opens his wonderful memoir by writing about this experience of being rushed to the hospital. Polio terrified so many millions of parents uh, up until I was a kid, and was one of the pioneer kids to have vaccine tested on me. But she'd, he'd go to bed early. And he's listening through the wall and he can hear what's going on. <clears throat> and by the end of the first half, his mother is very upset. His father is very concerned. Like many Americans, not completely thinking this through, they take a commercial break. If the Martians were burning down your building and vaporizing your neighborhood and everybody you knew, there probably wouldn't be a commercial break. But and weeks being collapsed into each other. <clears throat> At the commercial, his dad called maybe his, his brother-in-law or something. And the piece of the conversation was to the effect of, we're heading up to the cabin with food and guns. You want to meet us there? And at the end of the show, and if you have never heard this listeners, you really need to. I mean, again, you're used to a lot of sophisticated entertainment, but just suspend all your sophistication and let it happen. It's amazing. I'm sure you can Google it and hear it in two hits. It ends with Orson Welles as himself coming on and saying, you know, this was our way of saying to our audience, boo, happy ha Halloween, and we'll be back next week. He goes home, goes to bed. Um, NBC, you know, their switchboard basically overloads with people calling people in Manhattan rush to the East River to see New Jersey in flames. There's a wonderful scholarly book called um, um, I'll think of the name, but the subtitle is um, the, uh, A Study in the Mass Psychology of Panic. It was written by a Princeton scholar named Hadley Cantrell, C-A-N-T-R-I-L-L. -L. You can probably pick it up as a used book. And it's a study of switchboards breaking down, heart attacks, coronaries. As a lot of us familiar with the world of documents uh, relative to UFOs know, it comes up quite a number of times in the rationale of the potential of panic that we can't tell the people. And I mean, it's a workhorse in that realm, but Bud got it all, you know, through the wall. And he said he felt that if he ever talked about it in public, Phil Class, who was an ass and a really mean-spirited son of a bitch um, and smart, he, I, I think he knew what he was, I, I, well, we, we know now he was in the employee, um, but that he would just come at him and say, well, everybody can now see where Hopkins' original interest in the subject is from, blah, blah, blah the same way that years later, he attacked my sister and I um, when I, I was naive enough to think 
after he heard me speak for the first time that and came up to me about how impressed he was and how moved could he interview me well i'm going to turn him around sure and a whole chapter on my sister and i in ufos uh, uh ufo abductions a dangerous game um uh that as two nice little children we made up this story to feel special i remember thinking immediately after and my sister even more so that we wanted to go meet with him and make his nose feel special. Um, Travis Walton and I had a big laugh some years later over this and a friend took pictures of us with the book because the, the chapter where he tries to take Travis on, of course, without ever having the courage to even speak with him once in his life, um, our chapters are right next to each other. So that was always a, a point of pride with me. But yeah, that, that story was a wonderful part of Bud's childhood, and he wrote it up in a, a small memoir that he never intended to have published. Bud died of cancer at 80, but many years before, when we were close, um, he developed kidney cancer, and he lost a kidney. And then as any cancer survivor knows, you go through the process of one year clear, five years clear, 10 years clear, but that brush with mortality made him realize that there were a lot of things he wanted his daughter to know about him that she might not otherwise, she was quite young at the time. And so he wrote it up as this wonderful um, uh, monograph as they used to be called. And um, my parents adored Bud and he thought the world of them. And I still have a signed copy to them of it with that story in it. Wow. That it made it to the final cut. Beautiful. Okay, we'll turn it back to the art model, Nicole, who there's a synchronicity when I heard about that. And later, I'd like you to get into a little bit about the, we were talking a little bit before we started taping about the music aspect, your sister yeah. and music and that sort of stuff. But Nicole, have you got something you want to talk about? Quick question here. Are we yep. recording this or is this going out live? Uh, this recorded. is recorded. Yeah. Good. I'm going to take a quick bathroom break and be right back. All right, let's pause. <laughs> 